Women Taking the Lead, episode 143. If you don't charge people, they don't believe the value is there. They may still do it because there's no downside risk because they're not paying. But if you really want people to perceive the value, you have to make them pay. And that requires you to really find out what it is that they most need, which makes you more uh, fulfilled because you've done a better job at your mission. Hello, my name is Jody Flynn and welcome to Women Taking the Lead, where we are all about creating blasts of inspiration to help you overcome self-doubt so you can lead with confidence, integrity, and a sense of humor. Head over to womentakingthelead.com to join the community and get the resources to support you on your leadership journey. Now, your future awaits, so let's get started. Welcome to Women Taking the Lead and I'm excited to be bringing you the male perspective today. This podcast isn't just about women helping women. It's my philosophy that it's going to take both genders working together to see more women stepping up as leaders. We can gain a lot of insights from men. So I interview men who work with women around their leadership development. And as our guest today, we have Dave Fries. And Steve Forbes, the editor-in-chief of Forbes Media, has called him a grand master of communication skills and elite books, has called him one of the 50 most influential business thinkers today. Dave Fries is an attorney, author, entrepreneur, and speaker who has lived a fascinating life that took him across the globe and exposed him to master communicators, persuaders, and negotiators in hundreds of nations and across many cultures. He is a master of teaching enhanced communication and how to go from being persuasive to being truly influential. Dave, it is an honor to have you on Women Taking the Lead today. So tell us a little bit more about you so everyone has a good sense of who they're listening to right now. Well, Jody, thank you, by the way, for having me here. It's an honor to be here. And I've worked with lots of women's groups and women's professional groups and I come from a place of wanting to be very helpful in something that women keep telling me is important to them, not just in their professional lives, but in their family lives, which is how do I do this better? Um, I guess something that people might want to know about me is that I was trained, among other things, as both an attorney and an interrogator. And when people hear about interrogation, they automatically think because of the world we live in, negative thoughts. But it's like everything else. You and I were talking a little bit before the show. And one of the things that you said is when you come from a place of really good intention, people receive what you have to say in the right way. And uh, that's my experience. I always looked at negotiation and interrogation as finding a place where I could understand what it was that people wanted and needed and I could build trust and I could determine why they were willing to share information with me. And it's the same with communication. I, I, I am fond of saying all communication is manipulation. And I say that to deliberately provoke people, Uh, but it's true. I mean, we may be trying to manipulate people to smile or to have a good time or to laugh or to learn something, but it is manipulation nonetheless. You're trying to get someone else to do something that you want them to do. What really matters, again, is where's your intention? If you've really figured out that what you're trying to persuade them to do or talk to them to do or talk to them about is beneficial to them, then that's going to be what you need to be doing. And so I'll talk a lot today, not just about the strategies, but the tactics. So once you get clear intention, uh, I hope that we can do some things that people could take away and use right away to be better at this. I'm like rubbing my hands together right now because I can't wait to get into all of that. But to start us off with Dave, share with us a story of a woman who has impacted you as a leader. Okay. Well, there are so many because I have a tiny five foot tall, she claims, but probably is not a mother. I have an awesome earth mother wife who is one of the calmest people I know. And we've known one another since we were very young. And I've had very influential teachers in my life that really turned me around because I was a little bit of a, I was a smart kid that wasn't very cautious about the things that I would say to people. And, And now I work with a team predominantly of women. And so I have women in my, I, I'm fond of saying I live in a very estrogen rich environment and I have all of these women who have profoundly impacted the way I think. And I've learned a lot of the techniques that we're going to talk about today from women. Interestingly, it's sort of a powerful combo when a man learns something from a woman has to bring that feminine side of how they think to the process of communicating and persuading. And then all of a sudden you realize like, hey, wait, women taught me this. 
but they're not always doing the best job they could of using it themselves. And then I teach it back and watch that change take place. It's a very cool process. So, but I would have to say, if I had to pick one that my wife has had just the most amazing impact on my life because we're together so much and I'm all fiery and, you know, hard charging. And she is a person who gets things done, but she's very calm and she's very methodical and she's, uh, it is really a yin and yang. And I think we've both, she's got to be a little bit more fiery when she needs to be. And I've been able to calm myself down a lot more. And is there any, any stories you've had where like something she did or said just kind of like really landed with you and you were able to adapt into your leadership style? Yeah, absolutely. So I have a, I'm not a yeller, but I will have a tendency to use that, you know, sound intentionally. I don't usually yell at people because I'm really mad, but I'll raise my voice strategically if I need to. And there have been multiple times, mostly with the kids. The, the, this is where I learned my best lessons from her, even though she is a brilliant businesswoman and has formed multiple businesses on her own. But there have been a number of times when I went, you know, probably a little bit too far with the theatrics with the kids. And she would just say to me, really, that's the best that you of all people could do. How'd that work out for you? <laughs> and that is just, just humiliating enough to make you go, oh. And so uh, it was It was that same line. I think she realized how well it worked on me the first time, and she would use it, you know, every couple of months if I got a little carried away. And finally, I stopped doing what I was doing. But she would just wait till I went a little too far, and she would say, really? Hmm. Just subtly yeah. put it in there. You don't have to scream or nag. You just subtly say you're something. The, you, so you're <laughs> the communications expert. Did that, did that work? pretty well for you. Was that, that was really the best you could do. That's the best you could come up with. I love that. And Dave, you, you spend a lot of time with women and you have a lot of women in your programs and you speak in front of women who are, who are eager to learn what you have to offer them. And I know from our conversation before you interact with a lot of these women, they, you know, when you're speaking, they're in your, your workshops or they're coming up after you and sharing their experiences with you. Mm -hmm. So I know you have a unique perspective in that, you know, these women trust you and they're sharing, you know, a lot of the things that are going on for them in their lives and in their businesses. So what is something you see in women that that's holding them back? Well, in business, one of the things that I notice is, you know, I meet these amazing people, these women that have created professional practices or have risen to the leadership of their professional practice, um, or they may be in an allied healthcare profession. My wife is now a lactation consultant and she ran the very rare uh, private practice with, uh, I think she had three or four lactation consultants and people answering the phone and things like that. And, and, uh, so I would go and I would speak to conferences of lactation consultants or conferences of, uh, female therapists or, uh, but obviously very bright women who had risen to a pretty high point in their professional training or in creating businesses. And I was shocked time after time to find these people providing amazing services but who were really afraid to charge and they were trying to build great teams, but really wouldn't pay other women what they were worth either. And it was just fascinating to me. And it really goes back to mindset. When we dig into this, we'd find over and over and over again that women in business, women that were returning to the workforce, women in professional practices, all had this, but it was especially true in creative areas and in the areas I found uh, of, you know, uh, medical professions and allied healthcare professionals. It was especially true that they felt like they were doing something for people. It was the nature of what they did to help other people or heal other people or get other people to see the world in a different way. And that somehow that was inconsistent with charging, that charging people what they were worth was like a, a, a a dirty, it soiled all the good that they had done. And I mean, I'm only exaggerating slightly the way that they described it to me. And so that was fascinating to me, but I would see it over and over and over and over again. And so I think it is something, and it is something now that we try to address when we're doing programs where there are a lot of women in, tr in, in the training. We try to get them to realize that this may be something that's lurking back there and really holding them back. And it's amazing that these, you know, these are women who have 
really built value. You know, they've tried to find out what is it that their patients or their customers or their clients really want and to deliver it. And yet they are afraid to kind of take credit for that. And they're shocked, by the way, when we tell them, oh, men often say, oh, if I don't charge for this, people won't do, they won't see value in it and they won't do what they're supposed to do. And women like scratch their heads and look like, at me like I've said something insane. So that is one area where, and obviously, you know, you're hearing this from a man, it's an overgeneralization, but to the extent that a man's perspective is helpful to everybody on this, I have seen this over and over again. And, and when I went to Penn Law, which was a long time ago, that law school was already tilted 60, 40 in favor of women in law school, which was very unusual at the time, way more common now. But even there, I would meet these brilliant women who are obviously, they're going to an Ivy League law school, they were in the top of their undergraduate class, they had great work experience. But they were afraid when we got out of school to charge or to get what they were worth. And it was just amazing to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm glad you, you pointed out that example, too, because I'm right there with you where, you know, I interact with a lot of women who are coaches, um, who are in um, medical fields. So largely helping professions. And I find it very common in the helping professions that people have a hard time charging what they're worth. Yes. Because there were, you know, it goes back to they're like, well, th I feel compelled to help people. It's mission driven. It's part of my purpose. How can I charge people for allowing me to live out my life purpose? And, it, you know, and there's probably a better way to do it. But for me, it always comes back to do you want to keep the lights on? Yeah, I, I mean, I, <laughs> I, I do think that that intellectually we have to get them to really associate with what that means. I say to them, are you serving this mission that you've created for yourself optimally? If you're worried about keeping food on the table, paying the mortgage, paying the car, and more importantly, doing the things for your kids if they have them, like college. I mean, I tell them I had to spend $600,000 to put my kids through college. Like, do you want to be able to do that or not? And then there is this very strong, it's a persuasive argument when you really get people to think about it, that compliance, meaning when you teach somebody something or you provide the service or you provide a product to them, you've got to get them to do their part to make it work. The, you, you can't do it for them in most cases. Or even if you do something for them, there's usually a part they have to do to make it work. And if it has become absolutely clear to me that men were right about this, because they would tell me this as I was coming through the profession of forming businesses, if you don't charge people, they don't believe the value is there. They may still do it because there's no downside risk because they're not paying. But if you really want people to perceive the value, you have to make them pay. And that requires you to really find out what it is that they most need, which makes you more uh, fulfilled because you've done a better job at your mission. I actually got a client one time for this reason. She was um, going after mid-sized companies. She was incredible, incredibly smart, talented, and capable. But the companies, one of the companies finally came out and told, like, she would put in proposals and, you know, half of them would get declined. And then one company reached out to her and said, hey, can we talk? And what this gentleman had to say to her was, we wanted to hire you, but you charge so low that some people in the room didn't believe you were capable of doing what you said you were capable of. So we couldn't hire yeah, you. Yeah. I mean, I just, my daughter got married on, who is by the way, an archeologist and another very powerful woman. Uh, and she got married on Saturday and we had, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> we had a day of wedding, uh, like organizer coordinator there because we were mm -hmm. doing it at a remote location and it was just complicated. And I gave her double what the contract said to. And I said to her, I'm taking the hit here so that you know you have grotesquely undervalued. I think we were like the fourth wedding she'd ever done. And I said, mm -hmm. you've grotesquely undervalued what you did here. And so let me tell you all the things that were amazing from my perspective or my wife's and then realize that people will be suspicious like we, we weren't because you knew my daughter. She just did an amazing job. And uh, I one time had a, a um, man, so this wasn't a woman, come and clean the gutters on my house for like $75. And I did the same thing. I paid him $150 or $200 and said, I don't want to go up on the roof and do this thing that you could do 
and you could do it without getting hurt. I'm sure I would hurt myself. And so I'm going to give you more money because when I call, I want you to say, oh, that's the guy that told me I should charge more money and I got to take care of him first. And I told her the same thing. And I'm pretty sure that had I not actually paid her, if I just said to her, oh, you did an awesome job, you're worth more money, she wouldn't raise her fees. And I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure from having talked to her where I just put my money where my mouth was and paid her a lot more than she was asking for, that she got it, that she said, geez, I got to charge more money for this. And people will actually be feel more comfortable and be happier, which is what she wants to do for them. So, Yeah, it's that's definitely something that has to change. And I'm sure you're going to get into more of this and how to change that mindset. But before we get really into that, that part of the conversation, I'm curious on the flip side, what you've learned from the women you've mentored, like how, like something that they've contributed back to you. Sure. So uh, if we want to talk about uh, tactical and strategic things, I've got an example that kind of combines both things that women have taught me. So at, Perfect. after my, like I'd give speeches to conferences and conventions and women would often come up to me, which men would be way more reluctant to do and say, oh, that was really interesting. But what would you say to your 12 year old daughter about this or that? And then I would get emails from women which again, men less frequently do. They're less open to this. Men think, oh, I'm a great negotiator, communicator already, this guy, unless he really entertains me, I'm not gonna listen. So, But women, whether you're entertaining or not, which I like to think of myself as being, are more open to these skills, to the idea that there might be something that they could learn. And so I found it was way more common for women to approach me after the, the speech or by email or social media and say, what would you do with your four-year-old? What would you do with your 23-year-old? And so eventually I did something that really changed my life. I took all of these skills that I was really talking about in business and I wrote a book called uh, The Language of Parenting, which is kind of a Bible of these the strategies of great persuaders and communicators and influencers, as well as a reasonable number of the most powerful tactics. So not only did women cause me to write this because they clearly wanted this, which amazed me because I thought of the most effective communicators that I knew in my life personally were, were women. Men had a, like a narrower style of communication and they were either good or not depending on the audience. They had their thing that they would do and they'd either resonate with an audience or not, which is when I watched women, they were more adaptable. They listened to who they were with. They changed their tonality. They, you know, uh, communicated in a way that was designed to be received by the recipient. And they were really good at checking back to see if their message was heard. Uh, so not only did women teach me those things, either overtly and intentionally, or by me watching them, but they also asked me lots of questions, which caused me to write this book. That caused Steve Forbes to give me that review you mentioned earlier, and we were off to the races. Uh, so I have to thank women really for my speaking career, which is one of the happiest parts of my life. I mean, I like being a trusted estates lawyer, but and I like being home with my family, but I also love flying out on Thursday and speaking on Friday and then coming back to spend the weekend with Robin. So Because I could impact a lot of lives. Uh, I, I could tell you a specific technique that's rooted in things that I learned predominantly from women, although one scientist who studied uh, female communication and then sort of helped me with this. But if you Google Dave Fries, F-R-E-E-S, and the six-word question, any of your listeners could see video of me doing this. So the six-word question works like this. I, I always teach it in the context of how I was speaking to my kids. So what is a – Jody, do you have children? I never ask. I don't, know, but I have 11 nieces and So nephews. you've seen lots of them. I've seen it. <laughs> so you'll probably be able to answer this question by having seen all of this. But uh, when when parents want their kids to do something, like maybe play a sport or take a music lesson or do something, try swimming in this pool, and they say to the kid, do it, and the kid says, no, I can't, that's almost always motivated by an internal fear at some level. That's why kids usually refuse to do things. They're afraid they'll be embarrassed or they won't be able to do it or they won't be able to do it perfectly. And so um, supportive parents usually say, if you say to a kid, do this, and the kid says, no, I can't, a supportive parent will almost always say, we've done a lot of testing on this, yes, you can. And they say it all upbeat and with excitement. But what they're really doing is immediately arguing. They ask the kid to do it. The kid said, no. They said, yes, you can. And the kid goes inside and says, I told mom or dad, I can't. 
They just contradicted me. Here's all the reasons that I'm right and they're wrong. So we're starting off violating one of the most primary rules of negotiation of persuasion, which is we don't start from a position of disagreement, which is exactly what that supportive parent is doing. So once I learned this and watched hundreds of great smart moms, one of the things I would notice is they may not have had this exact language pattern, but they didn't go right to disagreement. So what I would say if a kid said, no, I can't, is I would say, I know you feel like you can't yet. Now, that is a very powerful little language pattern that's worth kind of memorizing because whether a person is a kid or an adult, if you ask them to do something that they need to or should do and they are afraid or they can't for some reason, if you say, yes, you can, you're arguing. But if you say, I know you feel like you can't yet, you've done two things. One, you've appeared to agree with them and they'll even nod. You'll watch them. They'll nod. Yes, they get me. I do feel like I can't, but notice, I feel like I can't is way less permanent than the absolute I can't. And then I also use the presupposition yet. So when you say, I know you feel like you can't yet, just in order to understand your question, they have to make a picture of themselves or imagine themselves being able to at some point in the future, which is less intimidating to them. So you just moved them twice and you appeared to agree with them. And then I look around, if it's my kids, I look around, I go, where's your mom? Because if a dad says, where's your mom, what's coming next is going to be awesome. <laughs> yeah. And I've actually manipulated, and I use that word advisedly, I've changed that kid's neurochemistry. I mean, of course, they've changed it. But I've done something that causes a mixture of a little curiosity and anxiety. They're wondering, like, what is dad going to say? So if you're at work, you wouldn't say, like, Cheryl, where's your mom? That would be weird. But you might say, <laughs> you might look around and, like, lower your voice and say, Cheryl, come here. Because that will do the same thing. It will change the neurochemistry of the person you're talking to to be more interested in what you're saying. It's called the Zargynic effect. And then I look around and I use the six-word question. I say, I'm just curious. So we're laying the groundwork for it. We're not judging. We're just curious. Or I'm just wondering. That's another good one. And here's the six-word question. What would happen if you did? Or what would happen if you could? Now, this causes the kid or the subject that you're talking to to imagine themselves being able to do it in a non-threatening environment. And very often, they will go from, I can't, and I say, I know you feel like you can't yet, but I'm just curious, what would happen if you could? They will very often change. I've, I've done this with people at work where somebody has said to me, I've said, can I have this report by Tuesday? No, I'm too busy. Well, I need that report from them Tuesday or they may not have a job. So I say to them, hey, Joan, come here for a second. I'm just wondering, just curious, what would have to change in order for you to feel completely sure and comfortable you could get me that report by Tuesday? And she'll go, oh, well, uh, if I could have somebody cover the phones for me, then I could do that. So we just went from I can't to, yeah, I could do it. I just need this very reasonable thing. Mm -hmm. But we have to take responsibility. So one thing I tell people is if you just adopt the belief that the quality of your communication is the quality of the response you get, that's one of the presuppositions of neuro-linguistic programming. But if you, if, if you accept that belief, then every time somebody doesn't get you, you don't just go, oh, they were stupid and shut down. And women are way better at this than men. When men tell somebody something and they get a different result, they often are just, that's it. It's over. I tried. I told them. I was clear. But women are more patient. Uh, again, a grotesque overgeneralization. But uh, women are often more patient in communication and will say, now, like if I ask for a turkey sandwich, Jody, what pops into your mind? What does that turkey sandwich look like? <laughs> well, I imagine two white pieces of bread, the turkeys falling out of the sandwich, and now I'm hungry. <laughs> is it is it the thin sliced turkey or the thick slice like at Thanksgiving? It's thin. And is there mayo or anything else on it? Oh, yeah. Mayo, mustard, pickles. See, now that yeah. would be totally – it sounds delicious, by the way, but totally different – than what I wanted. So if I said, oh, Jody, mm -hmm. when you're running out, could you please pick me up a turkey sandwich? And you brought me that delicious turkey sandwich, but it didn't match what I wanted. There is a tendency among people, men and women, to say, oh, I asked Jody for a turkey sandwich. She didn't bring me the one I wanted. That's her fault. That's not. That's our fault. Mm -hmm. So when we learn as humans to check back in, like if I said, Jody, you're going out. Can you get me a turkey sandwich? By the way, here's the money. Get one for yourself. I'm going to clean up while you're gone. And uh, could you get me the thick sliced turkey on rye bread with mayo, if that's possible? Then you would bring me back exactly what I wanted, and you'd be just as happy. But it was only because we talked more about it and that we didn't assume 
that the word meant the same thing to the two of us. And men are more likely to assume that. But women, while they have patience for it, they don't do it consistently. And if we could just get ourselves to be a little bit more consistent in taking responsibility for the outcome of what we're doing and not blaming our husbands or spouses or partners or friends or business associates when it goes awry, when we assume responsibility and get better at it, man, that makes a giant difference in the quality of your life. Absolutely. I, you know, I remember how much my life changed when I realized if I gave someone instructions and they didn't do it the way I wanted it to, it was because I wasn't clear rather than they were dumb or lazy or, you know, whatever, you know, label we come Mm -hmm. up with for a person who didn't do what we told them to do. You know, it just completely changed how I interacted with people. And I was able to say, oh, that wasn't what I wanted. My bad. Yes, that is what one of the things that made the most profound difference in my life as well. We share that. Uh, And and I had to learn that lesson several times over, which is a very common Mm -hmm. man thing. But uh, I, I did ultimately have this breakthrough where, and, and look, we're all human. So we still sometimes get perturbed. I've, I've seen people get perturbed when somebody in their business doesn't follow the standard operating procedure and actually comes up with something better. And I say, really, this is better by your own admission than what you were doing. Yeah, but they didn't do it the way they were supposed to. Well, maybe you should give them the authority to make these changes more often and let you know about it. Because this is an awesome change they made. And I have benefited so much in life just from feeling less stressed to getting better things from people than I probably would have gotten if I had told them just to do it my way. Yeah, absolutely. And Dave, what changes do you see are necessary for more women to, one, own that they're leaders and kind of take on that that role or just step up as leaders within their own life? So. I, I I do see that women who are great natural leaders and women who are learning to be leaders have, again, a mindset of self-imposed limitation. I believe that a lot of that is true of humans, but that men have like historically had a socialization that makes it easier for them to get rid of that. So this isn't something where women are bad at it and men are great at it. We're all just bad at leadership until we make lots of mistakes And then if we're paying attention, we become better leaders. I do have two resources on this. One on overcoming the mindset limitation. Have you ever read, I believe it's Carol Dweck's book, Mindset? Have you? Yes, I have. It's a great book by a woman. It's a little bit on the sort of esoteric cerebral cerebral side. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. That's why I'm going to couple it with a book. And, and women always say to me, why are you telling me to read this? I'm not interested in that. But that is part of the mindset. When I say to women all the time, when you hear yourself saying, that won't work for me, I already tried that, it didn't work, that doesn't work, you're, that's a defense mechanism trying to prevent you from grappling with something you're uncomfortable with. And that should now, from now on, be the signal to you as it is to me, hold it, I'm afraid of something there. I probably could do a lot better. Let me figure out what's going on here and pay attention to that. So the second book I'm going to tell you about is called Extreme Ownership, How Navy Seals Lead and Win by Jocko Willink and Leif Babin, two highly decorated Navy SEALs from SEAL Team 3 who fought door to door in Ramadi. And so I have women tell me, uh, look, that's not aligned with who I am or with my feminine energy. And I'm here to say these guys are teaching you the most to think about the most fundamental leadership principles, which admittedly they were applying in wartime. Because think about this. Jocko said to me one time, yeah, you know, people always tell me, oh, you had it easy because you just order people to do stuff. And he said, no, that's not how it works in the military. Uh, You really have to convince people that what you're ordering them to do is vital and important and makes sense that they should do it because you're asking them like. He said to me, Dave, when you ask somebody to do something, it might be hard. But when I ask somebody to do something, they might get killed. So it takes another level of leadership and persuasion. And when you get that and you apply it in the civilian world, you get massive results. And so I run a program called Business Black Ops where we have SEALs and special forces operators of other uh, sorts. We have retired military men and women. Um, clandestine services, you know, guys that ran counterinsurgency ops, interrogators. We have them teach. Here's what I learned. 
here's how we used it in the military or in clandestine service or in whatever context. And here's how we use it now to lean and win in business. And so this is – women see leadership through this totally different set of eyes and it's very powerful. And when I was teaching this course, uh, one time one of the metaphors we used for learning something fast – and effectively that could make a real difference in your life is we took everybody to a shooting range and we gave them each a Marine or a retired spy or somebody that was a good shooting instructor. And a um, number of women beforehand said, listen, I love everything about this. I love this energy because there's two kinds of programs. There's the yin and the yang. There's the business black ops program and three days to success. And they, they both are going for the same thing. But women who had come to the one were like, I'm going to do, I do everything here at business black ops, but I'm not going to shoot a gun. That's outside of my zone of comfort. And I said, yeah, that's exactly why I want you to do it. And uh, eventually, everybody shot. And within minutes of taking this little lesson that we taught them, here's a few things we could teach you, and you're going to be you know, an amazing shooter, which they were. These women were screaming at me, get me more ammo. I won't say – I will not <laughs> say the word that they called me, which was quite terrible. But they, uh, they just got outside of that zone where they felt comfortable and competent and realized that they learned something and could do something really quickly. And it was – very, very powerful for them. So That's amazing. <laughs> so overcoming this internal objection and honing these leadership skills, there's the Carol Dweck book. I love it for women. And there's the Jocko Willink book, uh, Extreme Ownership. Also love that for women. And every woman that I have referred it to personally one-on-one, -on -one, like I don't hear back from everybody when I, you know, I'm, I'm on a coaching call or talking to a convention or something, but every woman who I've ever spoken to and said, read this, has come back and said, I did not think I would like it. I did it for you because you told me to, and it was really good. I'm going to take it on. I've read Mindset, and yes, it's esoteric, but there's gold. There's gold in there. In that book. Mm -hmm. So brilliant, brilliant um, thoughts. Um and mindset. And so, yeah. And, you know, I do come from a family where, you know, pretty much all the men in my family have been in the military. Right. So I, I, I am not opposed to <laughs> reading a book that it has a military slant to it. So, but Dave, let's focus on you for just a little bit. I want to hear about something that you're working on right now that you're really excited about. Well, I wrote a program, which is a lengthy program of CDs and, you know, written materials and things like that. Instead of a, a last book, I did this program called Persuasion to Profit, which is for men and women who are in business that want to become more effective uh, communicators and persuaders so that they're better at negotiation. And I put a lot of stuff in there to make sure that they were better at home and in relationships too. And I've been talking a lot lately and doing a lot of research on moving people from persuasion to influence. And uh, that is the project that I'm working on right now. And, and here's the distinction. When you're persuasive, which I encourage everybody to practice being more persuasive, you are nevertheless working hard. You're trying to get people to look at something through a new set of eyes or a different lens. You're getting, trying to get them to think about it in a new way, to approve of something they might not otherwise have approved of. And if you're really good at being persuasive, you should have the intention of making sure that the thing you're persuading them about is really perfect for them. Um, but, but when you become influential, and that is when you combine building trust you know, from you to one person or you to a group with being persuasive to them and getting them to do things, then they learn to trust you because you're trustworthy and what you taught them or sold them was perfect for them. When you become influential, they begin to turn to you, as I'm sure your audience does. You know, they turn to you and want to ask you questions about all different sorts of things in their lives. That's the sign that you've moved from persuasion to influence. So uh, I'm working on a lot of research and writing right now, and um, it'll be a book and a, a, pro a series of products. But the way I build those and test them is through my live events. So I have uh, two that I do, one called Three Days to Success. And last year in October in Phoenix, that was all about how do we apply the laws of biology and physics to business and to our personal lives to radically transform them to be more of what we want so that we could be more of who we want to be and serve those around us, whether they're in our families or they're our friends or they're our customers or patients. And then the, the version that we're doing this year in October, Business Black Ops, is as I described, we're kind of getting to the same place, but we're we're learning force multipliers. These are things that the Army or, or Special Forces uh, operatives use 
to make their resources or their skills or, or their men or their women in combat more powerful. And so, for example, a purely military uh, version would be uh, night vision. Night vision is a five times force multiplier. If you give men or women in a combat situation night vision and they can engage the enemy at night, that makes them way more powerful. If you combine that with carefully selecting and training special forces operators and you give them night vision, it's an even more gigantic force multiplier. It's not one plus one equals two. It's one plus one equals 52. And so we are having people come and talk about their real experience in the military or clandestine service and their real experience in business and personal life and how they honed these leadership skills or these force multipliers and how they apply them in business and marketing and things like that. So I'm pretty excited about the live event this year because I've got so much stuff to teach people that we've been testing. And then we get their feedback to see, hey, did we teach this in a way where you were able to just take it and apply it and make your life better? Amazing. You've got a lot going on. I do. I do. <laughs> it's busy. I love it. Well, there's nothing wrong with being busy as long as you're busy with things that are meaningful and purposeful. So, and it sounds like you are creating quite an impact with the work that you do, Dave. So I'm very curious about the quote or the mantra that you selected. Um, so share with us that quote or mantra and why it has meaning for you. So again, you couldn't really pin me down to one. I had two. So, <laughs> Go for it. In the military, which you probably know, there's a saying that no plan survives contact with the enemy, to which I have added, so plan early and often, which sounds illogical. But here's why it's so important for women, is that in my personal experience, as well as you know the stories that a lot of successful women in my life have told me, is that it was planning. Like there was this reluctance and there were these barriers. And Planning is both potentially a blessing and a curse. If we plan and we say, I'm going to plan and I'm going to do, go, I'm going to do plan A, plan B, plan C, and I'm going to do that in a week and I'm going to be done and then I'm going to take action, that is optimal because the planning gets us over the fear and the reluctance and we feel and understand that we can act because even if things don't work out the way they're supposed to, which will usually be the case, they won't, we've got other things we can do. And the act of planning itself infuses us and instills us with that confidence that we can overcome that fear that was holding us back. The flip side, the evil side of planning is that women often use it as an excuse for not acting. They plan and plan and plan and they want to get to the perfect plan and there is no such thing. And the perfect plan is going to fail right away too, just like a sort of imperfect, quickly drawn up plan. Well, so we're shooting for something in between, but where we get to action. And the only way I've found to teach that is to say plan, but with an absolute deadline shorter than you want it to be for when the planning is over and the action is starting. You come at it with that right from the start. And then the, uh, the other one I actually mentioned already, which is if you just adopt the belief that the quality of my communication is the quality of the response I get, it puts you at cause when things go awry. And while that sounds like it would be more anxiety producing, it is not. And what you do, what you end up doing, you say, okay, when I did that, when I told that person what I wanted, it just didn't work with them that way this time. I better figure out why. And you, you know, you just get more used to saying, when I say turkey sandwich, what do you mean? This is particularly good with men, by the way, women. If you say, go get me a turkey sandwich, and you've got an important man in your life, and he like wanders off and comes back all happy, and he's got you a terrible turkey sandwich, he thinks he's done the right thing. But if you say, hey, when I say turkey sandwich, what do you, you think I mean by that? If they describe something that's not what you want, say, oh, you know, that does sound good. But what I'm really thinking is this. Or, by the way, they might describe an alien turkey sandwich, like you said, mustard and pickles. I would never have thought of that. But it is enticing to me now. <laughs> so be open-minded, too, that the weird thing that they parrot back to you before they go to get it might be worth trying. It's worth trying, Dave. You should try I'm gonna it. I'm going to give it a whirl. Really good. <laughs> awesome. Now, Dave, tell us how we can connect with you. Well, thank you for asking. I uh, am fairly active on social media. So... Uh, and there are a number of accounts, but the best one for your li listeners where I publish information regarding this is twitter.com slash Dave, D-A-V-E, freeze, or facebook.com slash David, freeze. And there are like lawyer accounts and things like that there, which will be less uh, interesting. 
but Dave Freeze or David Freeze uh, on Twitter and Facebook are great. And if you want more articles on the marketing piece of this, the negotiating piece of this, the family piece of this, you could go to success technologies.com slash blog. The blog is full of great resources for people. And uh, finally, if you ever want to come to one of these live events and, you know, we don't always shoot. Uh, there are different activities. And this year, you'll be get trained, among other things, by Jocko Willink, the Navy SEAL who wrote that book. Um, then you could go to three days to success.com. Awesome. So thank you for asking. And yeah, you're welcome, because I know people are going to want to find out more about what you're doing and get more of those techniques that you've been sharing, because they've been so good. And for those of you listening, and because I know you're off and on the go, you can find all the links and resources shared in this episode at womentakingthelead.com. Dave's show notes page, the blog associated with this podcast, will, well, this episode of this podcast will be there, and all of his information will be right there. Dave, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. We are all better for having met you. Jody, thank you so much. My pleasure entirely. Thank you for joining me on Women Taking the Lead. Are you ready to take the lead in your own life but need some support? Head over to womentakingthelead.com forward slash contact to introduce yourself. And to strengthen you on your leadership journey, I'd like to send you off with a quote from Marianne Williamson. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Again, thank you for joining with me, and here's to your success.